All right, y'all, it's time to turn the heat up today with yours truly. And today, we'll take a deep dive into a very special surgical situation I couldn't be any more excited to share with you all today. This clinical case involves a fascinating oral surgery procedure, extraction of a horizontally impacted wisdom tooth. And for those of you familiar with my work, you may already know my insatiable appetite for oral surgery. That feeling when you start to perform surgical procedures at a very high level in the operatory to help patients get out of pain and enhance their quality of life is truly like no other. From wisdom tooth extractions to placing dental implants, it's all really cool stuff. And I encourage anybody to get involved with proper training. But today, let's focus on this horizontal impaction of tooth number 17. I'm gonna to demonstrate today and give you step-by-step -step instructions on how I personally extracted this horizontally impacted wisdom tooth. Just as a preface, I'm not an oral surgeon, nor did I do a residency after dental school to learn this. I started with basic tooth extraction, then gradually took more and more challenging cases. Eventually, after doing a thousand plus extractions, I decided to take a wisdom tooth extraction course in Guatemala to perfect my technique. However, I want to emphasize that I do not recommend attempting this procedure without the proper guidance and training. My intention here is to show an interesting case to you, highlight the fascinating world of oral surgery, surgery and raise awareness for those considering it as a future profession. And before diving into the topic, I'd like to explain why I have such a strong passion for wisdom tooth extractions. Performing wisdom tooth extractions is pure oral surgery to me, and I find it incredibly captivating. Mastering this skill can greatly benefit patients, especially those in my patient demographic who have to travel quite far or simply can't afford the fees of an oral surgeon. I genuinely believe that Everyone, even dental students at the beginning of their journey should have some form of exposure to oral surgery, whether that's assisting or even shadowing. So maybe this video will provide some insight to you wherever you are on your journey. Looking back, this case was done quite a while ago, so there are definitely areas where I could have improved, which is precisely why I'm creating this video. I always aim to learn from my mistakes and share the techniques I've learned and could have utilized during the time of surgery to enhance the overall outcome for all of my future patients. And try not to crucify me in the comments below, since we're all still in the process of learning. It takes a lot of courage to showcase my early cases on the internet, exposing them to the judgment of the entire world. Anyways, I think it's a really cool case and I think you guys would enjoy it. So please stay tuned to the end. Let's talk about the preoperative assessment of a horizontally impacted wisdom tooth and what's going on through my mind when I tackle a case like this. Firstly, I assess the proximity of the inferior alveolar nerve canal. I determine whether it is in close proximity to the impacted tooth. And if necessary, I'll request a CBCT to gain a better understanding of the proximity. Next, I consider the Pell and Gregory classification, which involves a combination of letters and numbers that categorize the type of impaction. And if you're not familiar with this, quick Google search and you'll understand what I'm talking about. Pretty interesting information in assessing the complexity of the cases you may encounter. Essentially, these letters and numbers in this classification system help us determine the difficulty level of the extraction, indicating the tooth's position on the X and Y axis, meaning its depth within the bone, its proximity to the anterior ramus, and its relationship to the occlusal plane of the second molar. Understanding this classification is crucial for determining whether to take the case on or refer the case to a specialist. I personally know my skill level, and if there's a really deep impaction, you bet your butt I'm the first one to grab that referral pad and send the patient to the OS. Furthermore, I evaluate the depth of the mesial impaction, examining the distance between the mesial aspect of the impacted tooth and the adjacent tooth. This helps me identify a suitable location for placing those elevators, and it guides me in determining the amount of bone that may need to be removed and whether or not to section the tooth. Additionally, I consider the proximity of this area to the nerve. If the mesial impaction is in close proximity to the nerve, I'm referring out to avoid deep drilling near the nerve. We need a clear plan in mind when tackling horizontal impactions. Firstly, I need to create a large flap to gain better access to the impacted tooth. This involves making a hockey stick incision along the buccal surface and extending it towards that distal buccal line angle. Additionally, I create an envelope flap, connecting the first and second molars to provide adequate visibility. In this particular case, that tooth is buried, so we gotta dice this thing up and get it the hell out. Remember, when removing wisdom teeth or any tooth, there's only two factors that are required a location to put the elevator in, and an exit path for the tooth to come out. Always keep this in mind throughout the procedure. We'll talk more about this later. But for now, let's talk about the flap I created. You know, looking back at it, I realized there's room for improvement. As someone who has learned and grown since that time, 
I can see that it's not the cleanest flap. However, I'll show you what I think I could have done better here. And hey, if you've made it this far, please consider liking this video to show me you also share an interest in oral surgery. But creating clean flaps is a fundamental principle in wisdom tooth extraction. Now I'll show you guys how I properly incise the gums to get better access to the tooth by separating the gum tissue. But before we begin, please take a moment to share this video with anyone who might find this case super fascinating. Sharing it helps the YouTube algorithm and encourages me to create more videos like this during my free time as a full-time dentist. All right, let's dive into the technique. Rule number one for proper flap design is to please use a sharp 15 blade. And I often use multiple blades throughout the procedure since they tend to dull really quickly. If I'm extracting four wisdom teeth, I'm typically using two or three blades to ensure clean, precise incisions. This prevents improper separation and elevation of the periosteum, leading to excessive bleeding and a really messy situation. Always remember to use a sharp 15 blade. One of the mistakes I made when starting out taking out wisdom teeth was I wasn't applying enough pressure when making these incisions on solid bone. I used to be hesitant or afraid of making full contact with the bone during these incisions. And this was a major mistake as incomplete contact with the bone results in tearing and increased bleeding. Therefore, it is crucial to firmly press into the bone while making these incisions. This ensures a clean flap, providing a clear view of the surgical site. And during the flap creation, I always use the pointed end of the periosteal elevator. Others like the rounded edge, but this works best in my hands. I insert it underneath the gums, aiming to reach deep and touch the bone, and then gently flick it upwards. This technique allows for lifting of the gums and achieving a clean separation from the bone. And here, I could have made a better incision towards the second molar, creating a cleaner flap. Additionally, I could have also opted for a larger flap. I've actually noticed that larger flaps make the procedure easier for me without necessarily causing more trauma or post-operative pain for the patient. And it's really important to understand that longer surgical time rather than a larger flap can contribute to increased post-operative discomfort and slower healing. So if you need to make a bigger flap to get a tooth out in half the time, it's a no brainer. And as you get better with your technique, you can start to make smaller and smaller flaps, but just know the difficulty increases the smaller your flaps become. And in the past, when I first started extracting wisdom teeth, I made the mistake of creating super small flaps in an attempt to minimize trauma. However, I quickly realized that this approach resulted in poor visibility during the entire procedure. When flaps are too small, it becomes very difficult to see the tooth, leading to excessive bleeding and a really messy situation again. So I strongly advise against making overly small flaps. But all right, let's focus on the task at hand. Okay, take a look at that. Now we're in business. Okay, all right, cool. All right, the gums are out the way. The bone is visible now. We're making some progress here, cool. Now you may think it's time to just grab the forceps and pull the tooth out, right? Well, not so fast. First, we have to talk about a textbook oral surgery technique. It's called the buckle gutter. And the purpose of the gutter is to provide a place for the instrument to create elevation. Remember what I mentioned earlier about the importance of having a spot to put the elevator? This is where we establish the necessary leverage to remove the tooth. Using a 702 burr here, we go to the depth of the CEJ, or the cemento enamel junction, and go under it to gain the leverage needed for tooth extraction. In the past, I made the mistake of not going deep enough during this part, and it made extracting the tooth a real challenge. Typically, I create the buckle gutter from the mesiobuccal line angle to the distobuccal line angle and I sometimes extend it to the midline of the tooth. However, if it's not necessary, I try to avoid the distal aspect of the tooth. And when performing these cases, I keep a firm grasp on the Minnesota retractor, ensuring that it stays in contact with the bone, keeping the flap completely out the way so I can maintain visibility while drilling. And I actually learned a really useful technique from the oral surgeon I would always shadow. He taught me this trick where he would pass himself the flap by using the periosteal elevator. And by getting the Minnesota retractor underneath the flap, he's very quickly able to move the flap out of the way. This method has greatly helped me in controlling the flap during the procedure. All right, now we gotta give a nice samurai slice to that tooth so we can get it out of there. Sectioning the coronal portion of the tooth is needed in this case to create space for the roots and crown to come out separately. While sectioning, it's important to consider other factors like burr length, burr diameter, and elevator tip diameter. You wanna remove the least amount of bone possible, but enough to place an instrument in there to leverage the tooth out. The burr I'm using here is a 702 burr. It's the classic oral surgery burr. The working length is six millimeters, the head diameter is 1.6 millimeters, and the tip diameter is 1.1 millimeters. 
It may sound like excessive detail, but knowing these measurements in your head can greatly help you in these cases. So when I use this luxating elevator with a very thin tip, I know it will give me the leverage needed to get the tooth out. These details matter because if the slot you cut is too big and the elevator is too thin, you won't have sufficient leverage. These small techniques make the surgery faster, more precise, and more predictable during real-time procedures. I sectioned the tooth all the way down the crown, paying very close attention to the drilling depths and ensuring that I know the lengths of my burrs. It's important to have a clear understanding of the measurements, such as the typical crown length and the length of the burr that you're using. And I always pay very particular attention to the mesial aspect of these teeth. There's a triangular portion of bone on the mesial side of third molars, often referred to as the safety zone. This area has a really high ridge of bone compared to the distal or inferior regions near the roots. Therefore, I avoid those areas and concentrate on the safe zone to create leverage. All right, now let's see if we can get that crown out. Maybe, hmm, three, two, one. Crown pops off. What a beautiful feeling when you're able to section the crown on a horizontally impacted tooth. So I insert an elevator into the slot and gently lift the crown out. But our job isn't done yet. We still have to remove the roots. Since the part of the tooth that was causing the impaction is out, those roots are very easy to pop out of the bone. A couple of maneuvers here and there, put the elevator inside in between the root and the bone, and boom, they're out. And guys, I wanna mention that this stuff doesn't take much muscle or force. Everything in oral surgery should be pretty gentle to the touch. Fingertip grasp. Use a flick of the wrist if you have to, but once you start using too much force and muscle, you're doing something wrong. Start to identify where you're going wrong or try to find a different purchase point. I remember my time during NYU, I had an LMFS professor. She was this super sweet, kind, petite woman standing at around like four foot 11 who would effortlessly just dice up third molars and they'd just be flying out like nothing. I watched in awe as she performed these procedures, often using a stepping stool to gain better access to the patient's mouth. She would always emphasize the importance of technique over force, telling me, Akash, I section just about everything. I don't have the muscles you do, nor do I need them. No need to ever exert excessive forces. It's all about finesse and skill. Her words left a lasting impression on me, and I strive to incorporate her approach into my own oral surgery techniques on the daily. I focus on using finesse and minimizing trauma, steering away from forcefully extracting teeth. Now, in the early stages of my career, I lacked that finesse and relied more on force. However, now, I'll do the best of my ability to make the procedure atraumatic as possible, aiming for cleaner surgeries without excessive force. And nowadays, I carefully smooth out the walls of the socket by either using a bone file or a burr to shape the ridge corners, ensuring that there are no bony spicules. I'm removing that top layer of damaged bone also. It allows for better healing, leaving a superficial layer of fresh bone for better blood flow. Then I'm thoroughly rinsing out the area, eliminating any remaining fragments that can be left in the flap or the socket. My goal is to minimize dry socket here. And moving on, I'm performing a couple single interrupted sutures to give me primary closure and effectively close the wound. It's worth noting that some dentists prefer to not tighten the sutures too much, allowing the wound to drain naturally and allowing any residual debris to come out. However, personally, I find that closing the wound pretty tightly works for me. And before sending the patient home, I'll put the patient on an antibiotic and an analgesic to aid in their recovery. And sometimes I'll even send a medrol dose pack, which is a corticosteroid. Before we finish up, let's take a quick look at this x-ray and see how we can improve on the case. This was the moment during the procedure where I encountered some difficulty and felt unsure about the next steps. And upon analyzing the x-ray, I recognized that my drilling wasn't deep enough or wide enough as it should have been. Consequently, I wasn't achieving a good purchase on the tooth or obtaining the desired mobility. Another observation here is the burr mark which shows the angling of the handpiece. Often a common tendency for dentists is to inadvertently drill towards the back of the mouth instead of maintaining a more straight position. This is because the hand naturally tends to go this way as you're drilling. In hindsight, looking back, I wish I'd angled the handpiece more accurately to ensure a deeper and wider initial coronectomy. But these insights have taught me valuable lessons and I'm constantly striving to refine my skills. Seeking feedback from experienced colleagues by reaching out to my oral surgeon is one of the best ways to learn an enhanced surgical technique, ultimately benefiting your future patients. I sent this very same case to my OMFS and received excellent feedback. Doc goes, textbook, awesome, nice. I don't think there's anything you could have done better. And I'm like, this guy's been an OMFS for 22 years 
He's taken out thousands of wisdom teeth and he told me there's nothing I can do better? That's pretty sweet. And I know he's being generous, but I really do appreciate feedback like that because I'm always super driven to become a better surgeon. I'm always trying to take out more teeth and learn this craft as best as I possibly can. He did give me feedback that he mentioned that if the tooth is ever in close proximity to the inferior alveolar nerve, just take a CBCT because you may damage that nerve on the way out. So I'll definitely keep that in mind going forward. Being able to take on this challenge meant the world to me as I was able to alleviate the patient's pain and offer a helping hand in time of need. During consult, the patient told me of financial constraints they had, which prevented them from being seen by the oral surgeon. And while on the topic of finances, I wanted to highlight a topic that's kept relatively on the low. And this isn't to boast or brag, but to shed light on the opportunities that lie before us as general dentists. I was able to bill over $500 for this one tooth extraction. Albeit it's a horizontally impacted wisdom tooth buried in somebody's jawbone, but I was able to take it out and still bill for this procedure. We as dentists have the chance to overcome financial hurdles, pay off our loans, and create a fulfilling lifestyle for ourselves, our friends, and our families. This isn't just about a dollar amount. It's about demonstrating that every dentist has the potential to conquer any obstacle, particularly in terms of loans and debt payments. There is a pathway to financial stability and personal fulfillment. Coming out of dental school, the weight of student loans can be overwhelming. I get it. And I want to assure you that there is a way to pay off those loans. Dentistry is an amazing profession and the world needs you now more than ever, doc. But by dedicating ourselves to lifelong learning, valuing our craft, and continuously improving, we can achieve tremendous success and become the leaders of our community that we aspire to be. I get incredibly enthusiastic about these surgical cases because I genuinely love what I do. So that's my perspective on it. If you enjoyed this video and would like me to share more surgeries or provide similar content, please show your support by liking these videos and subscribing. Share this video with a friend who may also share a passion for oral surgery. And if you want to connect with me, shoot me a message on IG. Share your oral surgery cases with me. Tell me about your journey. Leave a comment down below and let me know your thoughts on this case. I hope you found this video informative and engaging. Until next time, take care. Continue pursuing your dreams with passion. Until next time, guys, take care.